Yeah, good. Well, first, I want to really congratulate the Picoware Institute. It's been a really delight for me to interact with uh, the center or the institute over the last few few years, and I've made some really good friends. And I'm particularly impressed by the the young recruits that they're bringing in. So I think the future is very bright. What I'd like to talk to you today about is uh, human cortical physiology and new mechanisms in the human cortex that enable you to do things like pay attention or decide what you're going to remember. Uh, and then after I discuss that with you, I'm going to show you at the end how we can use some of these cortical phenomena to actually control devices and perhaps develop uh, prosthetic devices for use. And it's, although not the main part of my laboratory, it is, it is a fun area to, to work in. Now, uh, obviously, frontal lobe pathology and, and neurologically, uh, tumor, stroke, degenerative disease, so, you know, bullets, et cetera, old lobotomies, many, many diseases affect the frontal lobe. You can put another slide up here and, and replace that with psychiatric disorders that are implicated. Uh, with the frontal lobe uh, dysfunction. I'm going to focus today mainly on the lateral frontal cortex, heavily involved in, if you will, cold cognition, cognitive control, thinking, planning, deciding, organizing, adjusting. And <clears throat> I'll show you a 30-second video of a patient who has a rare bilateral sequential frontal strokes kind of cartooned here. Uh, on his brain. And of course, if you take out the hippocampus bilateral, let's say from CA1 hypoxia, the patient can't remember anything, but you can talk to them and they seem pretty normal. If you take out the parietal lobes, the patient has perceptual problems or maybe inferior temporal uh, face problems, but you can talk to them and they interact. If you take out the frontal lobe bilateral, you have a profound disintegration of goal directed behavior. The patient is not able to do anything. And you will see this patient. He's not medicated. He's just under-aroused because the rest of his brain is not working. It's not getting proper facilitatory signals. You'll also notice he has some classic frontal release signs, these primitive nipple reflexes, you know, grasp and uh, snout reflexes. Okay, don't do There's a grasp reflex. Okay, there's a bilateral grasp reflex. Okay, for sure. Both hands. Okay. Let me just check some things here. You can never get I'm him to do anything you. you're saying. I'm going to tap you. It's not going to hurt. There's no activity. Tap. There's a snout can reflex. You? Again, pathognomonic for lateral frontal dysfunction. You can dysfunction. see there's a very prominent, you say, four plus snout reflex. No clear, no clear rooting reflex. Open your eyes. Open your eyes, sir. Open your eyes. Now, I'll just stop eyes. there. He never changes from this state. And the reason he never changes from this state is if you physiologically look at his response in any other part of the brain, it's profoundly reduced. It's not working, basically. So this is the abolic, as Carl mentioned, severely anhydonic, if you were going to talk about it in psychiatric terms, patient. And I'm going to try to convince you that at least three things are involved in the frontal lobe being able to regulate the rest of the brain. The first is the use of this ubiquitous finding in the cortex that high frequency uh, activity in the 60 to 250 hertz range tracks behavior. The second is that cross frequency coupling or phase coding of neural activity is important for precise tuning and timing of networks. And then finally, when different brain areas want to be engaged, they incorporate long range coherence networks. And I will show you evidence for each of those. Now, the big discovery. Uh, uh, when I trained, which was not 1942, but uh, activity in the, in, in the cortex was felt not to be, uh, didn't occur above 50 hertz. Now, since 200, since a series of discoveries, it's quite clear that every one of us has the main signal in our brain that's tracking every behavior we do, hearing, seeing, touching, moving your hand, is actually being indexed by ultra high frequency activity that has been linked by work in Carl's lab and other labs to underlying spike activity. So this high gamma, uh, you don't have to view it as an oscillation so much as a surrogate for spike activity in underlying cortex. It's pretty, what we do to extract different frequencies, we use conventional signal analysis techniques. That's a raw uh, electrocorticogram. And we'll use different uh, what are called wavelets that allow us to extract the, the analytic power, let's say, in high frequency or mid frequency or low frequency. Pretty standard uh, engineering techniques. Now, here's how we, we kind of stumbled on this uh, high frequency occurrence. We were asked to help the surgeons 
do some intraoperative mapping. So here's actually a patient about to be mapped for language prior to resection of a tumor, and you have to do it in the awake state if you're going to map language. So here is the... Okay. That's just your cardi that's just your cardiac pulse pulsation. And then the surgeon will put on electrodes. They're looking for epileptic after discharge. Feel some vibrations, Susan. When he's done, these it's electrodes normal. will come off and we'll put a high density grid on. We're gonna get ready basically. To do the 64 mapping. channel. Right now four millimeter spacing. We're trying to get higher density grids because we know we're not at the resolution of the activity. So that's the scenario. And the first thing we did to kind of uh, gauge where we were is we, we studied a well-known phenomenon. It doesn't really matter what the phenomenon is called a mismatch negativity. It's a, an automatic brain detection of a perturbation in the environment. And simply play a series of tones, break the tone. You get a known response in auditory cortex, an evoked response. We decided to look at time frequency. And lo and behold, when we did that, we found we got a lot of power in low frequency band. Here's time and we saw this cloud of high activity, which we didn't expect because it really hadn't been reported in humans. And we thought, obviously, we assumed it was an artifact and did a lot of other studies and replicated it with phoneme deviance. And again, we found, again, this uh, ultra-high frequency activity to this salient break in this uh, uh, series of stimuli. Now, I'm going to get back to this a little bit later, this intraoperative recording. But it's pretty tough because you only got about 12 minutes to do the study, and the operating room is not the friendliest environment uh, in terms of just a variety of things. Not the nurse surgeons, they're very friendly, uh, <laughs> sort of. So we decided to go to a slightly more leisurely uh, approach to this electrocorticography, and that's uh, patients who have intractable epilepsy, which is very, very common. Uh, medication refractory, one to two seizures a week with increasing evidence in the literature that if you can isolate the epileptic foci and surgically extirpate it, you can get remarkable improvement in control in the 70 and sometimes 80 percent range. So the skull comes off, a high density grid and other strips go on, typically with one centimeter spacing, although we've been doing some patients with 256 channel grids with four millimeter spacing. You get tremendous coverage. The skull goes back on the patient sitting there for um, two to eight days. When they feel like it, when there's a lull in clinical, uh, we will do various experiments. And I'll just show you a couple. Uh, this just gives you an idea of the kind of coverages you get. We do this work at UCSF and at Stanford and at Johns Hopkins. You get you know, very nice coverage over the area near and dear to me, which is frontal cortex sometimes. We only have parietal coverage. We tailor our studies, obviously, based on where the electrodes are. So let me show you what you can do with this. This is an fMRI, fMRI scan of a, what's called a verb generation task. It's a very common task used to lay out language preoperatively. So um, Matt, can you do this? You look pretty smart. Can you do this for me? OK, thanks. I'm going to give you a noun, noun, and then I want you to rapidly generate a verb to the noun. Okay, ready? Ball. Good. <laughs> it's a little slow. <laughs> Not, <laughs> and a little hesitation, you can see me after. But he did it pretty, he did it pretty well. <laughs> it should take about an MIT undergrad 1.3 seconds. In you, it was roughly 1.9, so that's okay. And you get a very nice activation in fMRI, but obviously the hemodynamic lag doesn't allow you to get precisely what's going on. Here's an ECOG grid in one patient. And you're going to see time unfold here. The movie's stretched over 10 seconds because it all happens so fast. And what you're going to see, by 200 milliseconds, you've extracted the meaning. Information flows to Broca's area. You pick the verb. Information goes to premotor. You select the motor program. You say it, and then you refire auditory cortex. And the whole thing will be over in about um, 1.3 seconds. OK. Onset. Hear it. Extract. Down, up, brocas, premotor, motor, 900 milliseconds, say it, refire auditory cortex. This is the only technique you can, that's possible to really track behavior in the human cortex in real time. Now, it's very powerful because not only the beauty of it is the signal space, particularly in this high frequency, and I should have mentioned this was tracking only activity, I must have it on here, 70 to 160 hertz. 
The beauty of this signal space is it's reliable at the single trial level. So these are stacked single trials, over 50 trials from auditory areas, from prefrontal areas, from motor areas, and these are the analytic amplitude of, across all trials. But you can, the beauty having the single trial reliability is you can use conventional animal single trial techniques. You can do resampling statistics and get st statistical effects in individual people, which you can't do in any other technique. As I'll come back to at the end of the talk, the signal strength is very robust in motor areas and in primary sensory areas, again, providing a nice single trial method for potential neuroprosthetics. Now, just to show you it's not just language, it's really any task. This is another quintessential frontal lobe task working memory. You hear a bunch of phonemes passively. Then I ask you, you know, when it comes by again, whenever there's an ooh, press a button, and then you go one hierarchy up, press a button, <clears throat> if and only if a target occurred two stimuli previously. And this is pretty hard. And the monkey literature and other animal uh, data and imaging all suggest that this is a lateral frontal cortex dependent task. And I'll just show you the results and you can make the determination yourself. Here's the zero back task. These are the non-targets, basically. This is the target stimuli here in the zero back. And if I can get this to work, and uh, there you go. Again, there's time, boom, onset, back of the brain. A little bit of frontal lobe activity, not much, easy task, press the button, you're done. Okay? So let's just do that again and stop it at, hopefully I can do this correctly just to give you a feel. Whoops. Well, anyway. Use your working memory and remember how much frontal lobe activation there was here in the zero back task. There you go, there's the distribution. Okay, now if we go to the more difficult test, same subject, same stimuli, just two back, which you can see again here. Back of the brain is exactly the same, but you see a massive increase in activity in subregions of the frontal cortex. Again, showing that this high frequency activity, it's independent of what kind of task, language, motor, vision, touch, etc. It's basically a ubiquitous finding in the human cortex. Again, single trial reliability, so stacked single trials in a working memory task. You can see activity in frontal cortex stacked. Again, when you press the button, very, very robust activity in, in motor cortices. Now, okay, so high gamma is in the cortex. It tracks behavior. How are brain areas put, you know, linked in a network? How might the frontal lobe be involved in these networks? Well, a very prominent theory and supported by actually animal uh, data uh, and increasing animal data is that areas of the brain, when they, if they become phase coherent in a certain frequency band, let's say theta band, four to eight hertz, it's the, the membrane excitability at the two areas will be in parallel and it's more likely that spikes can be sent back and forth easily. And if two areas are at a phase, it's much more difficult to, and this has been shown theoretically, experimentally, theoretically, and experimentally. We wanted to know whether this uh, coherence uh, network was operative uh, in the brain. So now, the first thing we did, I should also say, when you look at this data, it's also shown in the cortex, in, particularly in the hippocampus, that the phase of the oscillation predicts whether you're going to spike. So it's not like you have continuous spiking. You have phase-dependent spiking. We want to know were there coherence metrics in the human cortex, and then did they determine when you got a high gamma response, which is the surrogate for spiking? In other words, did the human cortex look like the rodent and, and the monkey cortex it should? So what we did is, and when I say we, this is work done by Ryan Canolti, very talented graduate student who's now a postdoc uh, in another lab, we took individual segments of EEG activity, one-second snippets from a bunch of patients we studied. We had 36,000 single one-second trial epochs. This is the raw electrocorticogram, which if you look goes from minus 200 to 200 microvolts. It's very, very big. We bandpass filtered at 4 to 8 hertz and phase aligned at theta trough different signals. Here's just three individual sweeps. So these are 36,000 phase aligned trials. The next thing we did, we didn't change anything else. All we did 
was change the bandpass to look at the high frequency activity. Note now that the activity is only minus six to six microvolts. This is a problem because the signal is very robust on the cortical surface, but it's small enough that right now we cannot pick it up in the scalp EEG, unfortunately. It would be amazing if we could figure out how to do that. So now here's the same trials, and now they're stacked, showing their high gamma. And if you remember the prior slide, if you look, the theta phase, particularly the theta troth, which has been shown to influence single unit spiking in animals, basically predicts high gamma amplitude. So Ryan was able to determine that there's a cross-frequency coupling, theta phase determining high gamma firing in the human cortex. And importantly, it changed by task. The degree of coupling, and that's a cartoon, of course, uh, the degree of coupling between theta phase and high gamma was very robust for motor-related structures. And then when you switch to language tasks, more involved in more robust for language-related uh, uh, language related cortices. Now, if you, so first we have high gamma. Second, we have the fact that low frequency oscillations basically predict when high gamma is going to occur. And third, let's look at how it's all put together in a potential network that would online be doing what you're doing in the room here, which is, you know, hopefully, you know, paying attention. So this is a very simple task. It's called the starry night task. I, I, it, I think it's because the background stimuli flicker a little bit. Stimulus trial begins with an arrow. It says the arrow points to the right. You're fixating here, and of course we control eye movements. And whenever a blue dot appears, all you have to do is press a button. So let's just look at a couple trials. There's a, there's a target on that trial. Okay, another trial. You're attending to this field. That's a non-target and so on. You can see how this plays out. Very, very simple test. The patients have no problem doing it. We have fixation. We have brain recording. So let's see how we put all of these things together in a task. High frequency oscillations, phase coding or phase amplitude coupling, depending on how you want to phrase it, and coherence. So here's a patient with extensive frontal and some uh, parietal grids. Now, the stimuli are being presented either to the non, when I say non-attend, the grid's on the left, so non-attend means that he's now, the stimuli are coming to the left field going to his right hemisphere. We're still recording from the left hemisphere. We only have grids on one side. And I think what you can see is that we get very nice high frequency activity in the parietal lobe from about 80 going up to 250 hertz. No problem there. The important thing is when we now present the stimuli contralateral to the grid in an attended field, you get a robust increase in activity. So if you go back between unattended and attended, a prominent increase in high gamma power. And if you now look at cross-frequency coupling in these areas, and again, we're going to look at the non-attended field, so left visual field for this patient with a left hemisphere grid, this is the degree of cross-frequency coupling. Here's phase by, pow by um, uh, amplitude of high gamma, and you can see coupling here in this hemisphere. But when you actually present the stimuli contralateral and you have to attend to it, you get a dramatic increase in the degree of coupling. So again, non-attended, attended. If you now switch to a right hemisphere patient, and, and this patient has even more uh, 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 more electrodes in. By the way, any electrode that's circled here means it is, it has, shows local high gamma activation. So it's considered an activated electrode. I, I might also mention that this high gamma activity drives the bold response for those of you doing fMRI research. So here we go, non-attended. So this is a right hemisphere grid. So non-attended is basically something coming into the right field left hemisphere. Here's the degree of cross-frequency coupling. When I now put the stimuli in the left field and have to pay attention to it, you see a dramatic increase. So non-attended, attended. So attention increases the degree of cross-frequency coupling and increases the amount of high gamma in the cortex in this very simple task. Now what about phase coherence? How are these areas brought together? So again, any electrode that's circled or has color in it is basically an electrode that has significant high gamma activation. That's what we took as our criteria to even be analyzed. Be like saying, is the single unit firing or not? 
So there are two things here. First, any one in blue has significant coherence within itself, within parietal lobe electrodes. So these are internally phase coherent. Any ones in red are internally phase coherent in subsets of electrodes in the frontal cortex. And any one that has both colors are showing long range coherence between these two areas. So regional coherence and long range coherence. And now this is non-attended. If we now switch to attended, what you'll see is the number of electrodes that show significant coherence between the frontal and the parietal cortex increases. So again, if you look back here and you look in some of the frontal sites, unattended, attended. So the notion is that as you, the, as you become, as you use your hemisphere to engage and allocate attention, you increase both regional and interregional coherence. So all three things are operative. High gamma tracking single unit activity, phase amplitude coupling tuning the uh, degree of activity, and long range coherence setting up networks. And I can tell you these are dramatically altered in neurological disorder. If you put a lesion here, you completely wipe out intrahemispheric coherence based on, and, on EEG studies. Uh, and you fact find compensatory changes in coherence metrics uh, in the non-lesion hemisphere. And I, I would defer to Carl, but there's increasing suggestions in the psychiatric literature that some of our intermittent psychiatric disorders are actually due to alterations in network oscillatory uh, dynamics, uh, which would also in some ways explain how stimulation, external stimulation may reset networks and perhaps improve behavior both in terms of rehabilitation from stroke and in terms of treatment of psychiatric disorders. Now, I thought, I said I'd do, I'd show a little bit of bed to, bench to bedside. Usually bench to bedside is molecular biology with a drug. This is a little bit different. This is a patient who's driving his wheelchair just by thinking of going left or right. right? He's controlling brain rhythms. And this is, uh, you're going to see him, and you might say, well, who cares? That's not much. But I can assure you, mobility is everything to neurological patients. And if you think, if you're, if you're you know, God forbid you're hemipredic and you try to open up a Coke can with a hand that doesn't open on one side. So just getting two vectors of control, open and control, could be a dramatic uh, dramatically helpful to neurological patients. So you can watch him drive this by thinking. What you see here is a standard 64 channel electrode rig. The amplifiers are on the back. The computer's doing the signaling. It's doing the analysis in real time and it's driving his wheelchair. Up in the corner here is a device we've developed and it's going into clinical testing actually in a month, which is this entire electrode set amplifiers and computer all here in a dry wireless attachable headset, uh, which these patients could actually just slip on and get not have to go through the hassle of having all this uh, particular gear. Now this is interesting. We can get three vectors, three independent signals right now out of scalp EEG data. So that's XYZ for a limb. The monkey researchers doing brain machine interface can get five vectors out. Five independent signals gives you X, Y, Z, open, close, four, five, X, Y, Z, open. And it's been shown you can actually mentally drive a robotic arm and actually uh, the animals can feed yourself. So this is an exploding and very, very interesting area of research. Now, um, and there's a lot of people doing this, but we decided to go after a little bit more difficult issue, which is uh, potential speech prosthesis. Because there's a huge number of patients in this country and around the world who have disorders like aphasia, where they know what they want to say, but they can't speak, or they have a severe motor uh, deficit like ALS, where they, their mind is clear, but they can't, they can't control their output. There's occasional patients are locked in. The brunt are really aphasic patients. So we decided to see if we could come up with a method to um, decode speech in the brain. First decode it, and then see if we could grab imagined speech. So first, to, before I show you the data, how tight is information in the cortex? Here's a grid on the superior temporal gyrus, a high-density grid intraoperatively. 
We've got 64 channels. Here's nine electrodes. And I just show you this to show you this incredible richness of signal strength in the cortex. Here's a time frequency plot. Here's high gamma in eight electrodes. And an electrode right in the when you basically hear, they respond to hearing. And an electrode right in the middle doesn't respond to hearing. It only responds when you speak. And you can see at the single sweep level. So there's a really rich dynamic. So the first thing we did is to see how well we could we could um, understand a very basic auditory phenomena. Uh, and we chose categorical perception. Categorical perception means you, 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 instead of having a veridical representation of the world, of the brain in your world, you chunk things into categories. It's very economical because you can kind of kind of chunk and have fuzzy boundaries. It's a very energy efficient mechanism. And it's been known since 1956 that when you perceive phonemes, there's powerful, powerful categorical perception. I'll show you an example. I'm going to play 14 sounds that are absolutely veridical, the, the transition. But you're going to hear really, you're going to hear just most people are only going to hear three things, ba, and then you're going to categorically switch to ba, da, and then you're going to categorically switch to ga. So here you go. Just listen to this. So did most people get that categorical boundary? It's pretty much, I mean, it's very common. And it's been, people have wondered for basically since it was described, do you take everything in and then subdivide it, or is it an automatic mechanism that happens early in auditory processing? So what we did is do a study where we had perfectly smooth steps. There's two hypotheses. In early auditory areas, there's a veridical representation of the physical stimulus, or they're actually grouped physiologically. And uh, to cut to the chase using various um, multivariate techniques, we were able to chunk the data into three separate groups, ba, da, and ga, which clearly showed that categorical perception is automatic and happens very early in auditory processing. And in fact, it happens in this small area of the brain. And very interestingly, and this will be great for optogenetic uh, uh, work, I think, in animals, the, there's an overlay. So you'll have a network of, say, four or five clusters of neural activity that represent, say, ba, and interspersed with that is another network that represents ga. And you can even share the same node. So it's a really rich way to represent uh, behavior. You can see there's four separate patients with their transition from ba to da to ga physiologically laid out in their cortex. And it all happens by 110 milliseconds. So with that, we said, well, we got a nice signal. It seems to do things with behavior. Let's see what it can do in terms of speech. So this is work done by uh, Brian Paisley, a really super talented guy. I, just to be very clear, when he said he wanted to do this, I didn't think it would work. Because you know we only get three or four signals at, from motor cortex. How are we going to get this huge richness of uh, you know, a, 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 the sound space, the difference between the word tree and baseball or Boston Red Sox and San Francisco Giants? I mean, those are big. Big differences. So <laughs> large, <laughs> enormous, <laughs> giant. <laughs> OK. <laughs> did you like that, Matt? That was good, no? <laughs> thank, thank you. So what we did, we presented words to patients with these high-density grids either intraoperatively or actually in some patients who had big high-density grids for epilepsy. We basically recorded their electrocorticogram. We came up with a reconstruction model that basically had, that used both linear and nonlinear properties of the electrocorticogram signal with the only band actually being useful, high, the high frequency response, not so surprising. And then we could reconstruct the spectrogram. And you can see here, the spectrogram looks pretty similar. And then what you do, you've got your model. Of course, models can fit anything. You hold out some stimuli, and you represent them to the model. And you see, can they actually tell you what you know, what was heard. And we had a 91% accuracy 
with chance would be this word or this word, 50%, 91% accuracy that we could that we were correctly reconstructing what word was heard. Now that looks all nice and it's all mathematical and it's complicated. I think this kind of sums it up. <clears throat> here's uh, from uh, this is data. Here's here's a high density grid interoperatively. Here's the same. STG area, and by the way, the reconstruction accuracy is higher with four millimeter than one centimeter grids, and that's why we're trying to move to two millimeter grids. You're going to hear here four words, Waldo, structure, doubt, property. First, the spoken word that the person would hear being presented to them. And then beneath it is the reconstructed word directly from the electrocorticogram played back. So the question is, do they sound similar or not? I'll let you decide. And I had a big argument with the postdoc. To, I said, make this. He said, no, it's not scientific. I said, you got to get a job. Make this slide. <laughs> so he made the slide. Just listen to me. It's a little difficult. OK, so again. Waldo. Waldo. Structure. Doubt. Doubt. Property. So that's plain. That's that's basically. It's not. That's actual sensory reconstruction directly from the human brain using these high frequency signals. Now that is. We were really very excited about this, but it doesn't really help the patient. It basically gets you a nice publication to help the patient. You need to have imagined. You have to capture imagined speech, because then you have a potential to make a prosthetic device. So I'll show you some. I'll close with just a little bit of unpublished data. This is how we've approached this. It's really hard to know when to look for imagined data. What's the time code, right? When do you think? When do you do anything, uh, basically? So our approach, and this is work done with Gerv Schalk up in uh, Albany, we play a ticker tape. And as the ticker tape comes by, the patient simply reads the ticker, ticker tape. So there's a talk condition. Then the ticker tape plays again. And now they have to imagine talking. That's the only way we could think right now to really get some control. We'll, we'll get smarter, hopefully. So. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers so the patient's just, you know, Ross reading the Gettysburg Address. Fourth then. On this continent. OK, so now the key thing is whether the electrocorticogram reconstruction of the word when they talk. And by the way, when they're talking, it's not the most robust signal because they get a little speech suppression. It's actually dropped, so it's amazing that this works at all. This is the reconstruction of them talking. This is the reconstruction of them imagine talking. And the question for you to decide is whether Four they look. Four and seven years ago. So we're pretty, we're pretty um, brought excited that we might be able to grab on this imagined speech. Now, this is just continent. one patient. So of course, we then extended it to eight patients. And I'll close with this slide. This is recording from, again, the main source of signal that gives you the best reconstruction is not surprisingly temporal lobe structures, particularly near language cortices. This is actually the first data I showed you, the speech reconstruction. That's the pure spoken word. And the lower the score, the closer the uh, activity is to the actual spectrogram of the word, the pure spectrogram of the word. This is just resting state when they're doing nothing. And this is the imagined condition here. And, then the Im and I think what you can see in seven of the eight patients, we're not as good as spoken, but imagery is better than uh, random pretty much in everybody other than this particular person. So this is an exciting, we're very excited about this. We think if we go to a higher density grid, uh, a two millimeter grid, like the kinds that are being used now in monkey research, we might even be able to get more robust representation. And the goal would be, of course, we're in, we have colleagues at Berkeley that are making an implantable 128-channel wireless device that goes epidurally, could be externally charged, like a cardiac uh, a pace, uh, pacemaker or defibrillator could be externally charged. The idea is that we could have these, uh, maybe have something implanted in a patient, and when they want to say hungry or love or whatever, they could imagine it, and we could grab the actual representation and play it back 
to their caregiver, their loved one, et cetera. It sounds a little crazy, um, and I thought it was crazy, but I don't think it's crazy now, having actually done uh, this work. So um, I'll close by just highlighting some of the people whose work I presented. The original, original verb generation work was done by Eric Edwards, who's now working um, up in uh, Washington University. Uh, Sarah Shapansky is a postdoc who did the uh, large-scale attention, phase amplitude coupling work. Ryan did the initial work describing phase amplitude coupling in the human cortex. Uh, Dean uh, Flinker, who's now at NYU, just started a postdoc, uh, did uh, the work on, uh, a lot of the work on laying out the microtopography of the auditory cortex using these uh, oscillations. The last work I showed you was by Brian uh, Paisley, who, a very talented, really talented postdoc, uh, who did the work on speech reconstruction. Down in the bottom row, I guess they're important, but these are the faculty involved. This is my neurosurgical uh, colleague, Mitch Berger. He looks happy. He's actually not in the operating room. Nick Bargro looks dour, but he's actually happy in the operating room. It's like a little circus of who's who. Uh, uh, Joseph Parvizi is my co collaborator at Stanford, he, a talented young uh, epile epilepsy neurologist. Uh, Eddie Chang uh, did a postdoc in my lab. He's now in charge of the electrocorticographic program at UCSF and just a, a really talented guy. Just had an interesting uh, nature paper on the cocktail party effect. Nathan Crone, we thought we discovered high gamma in 2003. We were wrong. It was actually Nathan Crone who really first reported it in 2000 in a patient at Johns Hopkins. So. Um, he's been, become a very valued uh, collaborator. So I'd like to close by just saying I think systems neuroscience in, in humans is approaching. Uh, I think for the first time in my career, I kind of see where human and animal uh, science is going to start to merge and get at some very uh, fundamental questions on how the human brain uh, supports behavior. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Yes. Of course, you cannot record from the hippocampus itself, but would you? You talked about uh, data phase briefly. Would you uh, well, imagine? Well, we can record. I didn't show you, you can, data. Oh, you we can. have electrodes in the hippocampus, and ah. you see during memory encoding, you actually see prefrontal hippocampal theta phase coherence and the degree of theta single unit and theta high gamma coupling in the human hippocampus predicts memory retrieval. So there is nice data. That's not from our lab. That's from a group in Germany. Great. Thank you. That was my question. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the very, very amazing talk. So I'm a molecular, I'm a molecular and cellular, cellular uh, researcher, so uh, that's why I'm not really uh, very familiar with this field, but I really feel the talk very stimulating and very amazing. So I just wonder, so basically, in the, uh, especially for the last part of your talk, you talk about so how you transfer uh, this um, um, this uh, activity in the brain into empirical data, uh, empirical signal, and then transfer them into physical sound. Yes. And also, I just want to know so how your work can uh, further proceed to detecting the um, human uh, thinking. So now you are you can <coughs> transfer this signal uh, of human uh, brain activity into physical sound. But how can you further proceed to uh, using this? to detecting people really think, not imagine, but think, and like yeah. conscious is kind of. Right, well, yeah. the conscious, we, I, Earl Miller and I were talking about this last night, this phase, and he has this concept, and I think he's probably right, this phase coupling actually limits the amount of information. There's a limit to your working memory capacity. There's a limit to many behaviors. So I think it has direct applications to understanding consciousness. In terms of thinking, we're kind of stunned we could even reconstruct a word. And whether we can really get it to the imagined level so that you could 
you know, you could make out what the word was when we drove the system with sensory input. We're not, we're statistically able to do it with Imagine, but we're not able to produce anything right now. We could probably categorically select, but I think it's really um, a ways off. I will say when we did the speech reconstruction, the Berkeley um, PR people sent us a press release about uh, reading the mind, and we got it, and we crossed off everything about reading the mind and said it's not reading the mind, it's, and sent it back, and they sent it out anyway. <laughs> and we, yeah, we had like 80 interviews, and the last, uh, after, in three or four days, and you're going crazy, I was being interviewed, and most of the interviewers are worried about, I'm worried about the biological use of this for patients, understanding the brain and using it for patients. That's where, uh, you know, I'm, I'm most focused, but pretty much every interviewer at the end wanted to know about Big Brother and reading your mind and, uh, you know, this stuff. And you got to answer it. You have to be polite. The last interview was with a very, very sharp um, radio and, uh, a person in Johannesburg, and it was a live interview, and she was great. She asked all the questions about ALS and stroke, and then she got to their repressive in South Africa to the press, cause it, and I... I went through my standard spiel. You'd have to have electrodes implanted. We're not even close, yada, yada. And then I just lost it. I said, do you do bridal showers in South Africa? And she said, oh, we always do something for the ladies. I said, how about this? How about we bring the groom in and implant him, and you can interrogate him? And she said, well, that's the greatest idea I've ever heard. So <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on out there in the world, but we're far away from <laughs> The signal's there. I think we can all agree the brain makes behavior. I would view this as baby steps in, the, the, in that direction. But. Thank you. Okay. With that, we'll conclude the morning session. Thank you so much. Thank you.